All right, thanks for joining today's talk. Um, today, I'm just going to focus on um, explaining what Red Panda is and a little bit about distributed systems, also what the RAP protocol is, and go into specifically Red Panda, obviously. Um, it's a good break from what I normally do. So normally what I do is I focus specifically on the tree in front of me, right? So I'm focusing on customer issues that come up and prioritizing those based on what's the most important to solve in the immediate term. And um, it, because of that, from week to week, you end up not being able to focus on the full forest and, you know, understanding how um, the, the tool that you're working on plays a part across the board and the new features that are coming up. Um, so it's good to just kind of be able to talk about where we're at and um, why, we, why Red Panda exists and where we're going. I'm a solution architect at Red Panda. I've been here for about a year and a half. Um, it'll be two years in, I believe, March or April. Um, and, but I've been a developer and in, in the industry, I guess, for a little over 15 years. Most of my time was at IBM. So that's also the reason why I know a lot of people um, that are in this meeting from IBM. Um, I also was at a company for a short period of time for a couple of years called Prodigy, and they made educational or they make educational video games. They're based in Toronto. Um, but um, I've lived in several different places. Dallas is where I live now, um, and I've also lived in Seattle, Toronto, and Detroit. So initially, and I apologize if you hear my dogs, uh, there's two things that are happening in the background. I'm getting my AC replaced today, and that's like a, an issue. And then um, also my dogs are in, in the same room with me. So um, let me know if that's uh, an issue. But anyway, we'll start off this talk by discussing distributed systems. And um, distributed systems from the standpoint of this talk, they have different characteristics. Um, scalability, durability, availability, and transparency are a few. Probably out of these characteristics, scalability is the most important. Um, the idea of distributed systems is that you are able to throw more resources at the system to be able to handle a variety of different use cases and, and larger and larger use cases. Um, but that's not obviously the one key characteristic. You get a lot of different things out of a distributed system. And we could, if we wanted to, um, talk a little bit more about other characteristics that um, distributed systems have. But um, an example architecture of a distributed system is something you see here where you have multiple different nodes or in the case of Kafka or Red Panda, multiple different brokers in a cluster. And they are all combined to form a logical um, cluster. So in this case, if you look at the, the, the dotted lines versus the, the solid lines, the dotted lines are the logical um, grouping, and these are the actual um, components that are that are making this logical grouping. So these brokers or nodes here are forming a logical cluster. The same thing goes for um, inside Kafka or Red Panda brokers. Um, it is taking place with the partitions that make up a topic. So topics are actually not they're just a logical grouping of partitions and partitions are the actual things that uh, the, 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 fi the, the files on a hard drive in, in this case that are grouped together to form um, a topic. And uh, so, yeah, Red Panda is a good example of a distributed system and there are a lot of other ones too. And Kafka, when I, when I, you'll hear me say Kafka or Red Panda, Red Panda is just a replacement of Kafka. So anytime you use Kafka in, in a distributed system, you could be using Red Panda. We'll go more into that as we go on. So um, as an intro into Red Panda, um, we are, you know, we just had a Series C. We have a number of customers. These are some of them. Um, but of course, the list changes as we go. All the different use cases are, uh, all the use cases are different for all these different use these customers. And some of them are uh, specifically related to machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, and 
I was hoping during this this presentation to be able to go into details on those use cases. Um, but I'll get more details to you on exactly how to get um, more details on those use cases directly from the source. Um, so why did why do we exist and why are we creating a solution that uh, replaces Kafka? Well, if any of you have any um, experience with Kafka, you'll realize that Kafka is actually um, very difficult to manage. It can be, especially once you end up having a sizable use case. It can also be expensive because each of those brokers that you have to use as part of the cluster takes resources and that resource costs money depending on the cloud provider that you have, even if you're running it locally. And also, especially if you're running it locally, related to administration of all of these components of, of the system. Um, so it can be it can be difficult to figure out also, a, Kafka is one component in an application or system. And there's a Kafka ecosystem out there that a lot of different applications speak Kafka in order to, in order to connect into these systems. Um, and so, depending on your use case, you'll need to pull in a variety of different um, applications, all with all through, from the Kafka ecosystem to make your use case successful. And with Kafka, you get you you have to figure out which one of those components you would want to pull in. There's multiple different schema registries, for instance, um, HTTP proxy. Obviously, there are multiple of those, and any other component if you want to transform the data. In some way, there's a variety of different um, components out there, applications that you could choose to do that. Um, but with Red Panda, we we allow you to connect to all of those applications in the Kafka ecosystem. We are like that's we are drop-in replacement of Kafka, but we also include some of the uh, some of those components out of the box in the single binary that that Red Panda is. So um, some of those things are. The schema registry. There's a schema registry built into Red Panda, and also there's an HTTP proxy so that you can make use of very lightweight clients to um, get access to the data that lives in Red Panda. And then, like I was saying, all of the different Kafka ecosystem tools will plug into Red Panda in the same way that they will with Kafka. Um, so, why is Red Panda? around right now like why what what has changed recently to make it possible for red panda to exist and to be doing well in this space and um, this is a little bit this this graph shows a little bit of the history right so um rabbit and came around in 2007 as a really good way to connect multiple different applications and um, more as a pub sub like message queue uh, tool and then kafka was a little bit later but it was able to also tap into that same similar type of application integration, system integration um, niche, that, that, that spot in the market. But it also um, did some things a little bit different where it made it possible to, have, to, to not have to rely on more like a, a, so much of a point to point communication and allowed it to be, to have the data in um, the queue or topic in this case with Kafka be um, readable multiple times by many different clients. And so it, um, for certain use cases, it makes a lot more sense than RabbitMQ. And RabbitMQ is not a, Kafka is not completely replacing RabbitMQ because there's a lot of use cases that continue to make a lot of sense for MQ. Um, but then Pulsar came about after Kafka to do something very similar to what Kafka does. But, um, and then now, Nowadays, uh, there's Red Panda, which is also taking the same type of um, use case that Kafka targets, and it's Kafka API compatible, but it takes advantage of the latest hardware. And what I mean by that is um, there's new hardware that we can, like the, the drives are completely different now versus when Kafka was created. And NVMe drives are cheaper and more, um, more possible to be installed. You're, you're likely to be using NVMe drives. And when you do, that speed that you get, we will take full advantage of because we um, bypass the, the file system, the operating system in order to uh, write directly to disk 
and um, use as much of the performance of the hard drive as possible. And the same thing goes with um, the cores that you are in memory that you would give to the to the brokers. We will use as much of the resources as possible um, in, a, in a very, very good way. And a little bit more, we'll talk a little bit more when we get to the wrapped discussion later. Um, and so it's a single binary, easy to install, which is one of the biggest pain points with Kafka, like I mentioned before. You don't need to worry about installing many different applications to get the lion's share of what you need out of uh, a, a Kafka API compatible system um, when you're using Red Panda. It's also um, in, in, in large part because of the, the uses, usage of resources like I showed before, it's also much faster than Kafka. So this is an example, this is a chart showing how with Red Panda, with F-Sync, you get um, very good, very low millisecond latencies for P99 um, versus Kafka in the same scenarios. And these are just a variety of different versions that we're, we tested with. For more details, this, this is one chart, obviously, and one use case in a lot of ways, right? One configuration, one benchmark, one gigabit, one gigabyte per second workload. Um, you can get a lot more details if you follow the link there, and I can provide you this chart afterwards. So um, many of you may be familiar with Jepson. If not, uh, Jepson is a, uh, a report. It's a, a series of tests. It's a process that you can go through if you have an application, that, a, a distributed application, and they will go through a number of tests to try and find holes in your system how you could potentially um, suffer data loss and um, what doesn't work as expected or what the, the normal usage would expect for you to be able to do. And so we have worked with Jepson to get a Jepson report. So the same thing applies to Kafka and a number of other different distributed systems. And um, so you can find the Jepson report on Jepson's website and then also our response to it here. Um, it's not one of those things where you would um, get a, a, a score, like a, a, a percentage, 80% or 100% or a grade or anything like that. It's more just like, what is the state? And it's very a very good thing to um, even go through the process of getting a Jepson report. So I think that it's it's been very helpful to have this. And we are possibly going to be working with them again in the future. I know that there was talk about that, but I haven't heard anything about that in the last several months. Um, the other thing about Red Panda, so I've been, a lot of the things that I've been talking about up to this point are the single binary and the idea of like, you know, being able to install that, but we also have the, you know, our cloud offerings, which installs that binary into a number of different, uh, into two different, uh, um, well, we have different cloud providers that we can, that we, we, we provide our cloud um, offering on, and then we also have multiple different cloud offerings dedicated and BYOC. So dedicated is where we would have, um, I had, think I have a chart on this, but dedicated is where we manage everything for you in our cloud provider um, location. And then, but BYOC is where you are able to use your BYOC, your um, cloud uh, environments, your project in Google Cloud, for instance, and then we would uh, manage that for you just in the same way as dedicated. Um, and because we are so much more performant than Kafka and we, and, and there's a single binary that you're running, you save a lot of money on total cost of ownership, but I don't have to go into this right now. I'm going to get more into, um, details about the technology and, and you can read about this here if you're interested. Yeah. So this, this goes around, um, the different options, but, um, there's. For, I, I, in my time at Red Panda, I've been mainly focused on um, self-hosted deployments, which is related to Kubernetes, uh, Terraform, Ansible. So these methods of deploying are the ways that I've been dealing with. That's not to say that most customers go this route. I think actually most customers go with our managed offering, but um, I'm more focused on developing the Helm chart and then making sure the Red, that Red Panda works well with that. And we have different licenses. Um, so you can just use 
Red Panda Community Edition, and it's uh, perfectly, uh, like you, you don't get any support, obviously, but you have all the capabilities uh, that you see listed here. But with Red Panda Enterprise, you get support, then you also get other things like tiered storage and um, all the benefits of that. So that's a little bit about like what Red Panda is. Um, and then we talked about distributed systems also. One of the reasons, but I talked a lot about like, like, you know, I just told you like the sales pitch basically around why Red Panda, like that Red Panda is better than, than Kafka and Numbers, but why is that the case? And it really comes down to the RAF protocol. So what is the RAF protocol? The RAF protocol is a consistent space system. So it's, um, here's some definitions of things that um, are important to understand what the RAF protocol is. Um, forum is the idea of being able to, and it, it's the same thing in politics and, and uh, you it's just being able to reach a consensus, right? So the 50% of all um, healthy active members plus one. And that's important to note that like you can only reach consensus. You um, sorry, you can only reach uh, have a quorum and reach consensus if you have um, if you're taking into account the healthy brokers. And um, it, this is a, one characteristic of the RAF protocol is that you want to because of this you want to because of the need to get to the quorum you want to have try to have like an odd number of healthy brokers. Um, or a odd number, odd number of brokers generally. Um, that is so that you can guarantee that you could have um, a majority. If you if if two if you have a four broker cluster and two vote one way and two vote the other, then that could end up in a state we call like the split brain situation. Um, but that's rare, more and more rare, especially given the fact that it would be very difficult to. Um, like, what would be the case where two different brokers would have the same, um, go the same way, right? But you avoid all those issues by going with an odd number. Um, there are other different consensus algorithms, um, and I think Paxos is another one, if I remember correctly. Um, and I think Raft takes a lot of um, learnings from Paxos, if I'm, if I'm remembering the name correctly. Um, and potentially simplifies it, but I, that's out of the scope of what I'll cover here and also out of the scope of what I'm really knowledgeable to talk about. But we have a lot, I, I included a few links here that um, talk specifically about the RAF protocol. And if you're interested in this, um, you can get more information here. So what, how we use RAF in, in Red Panda? Remember the previous, um, diagram that I showed when we were talking about distributed systems and how we have a logical topic and a logical, a logical topic and then a logical cluster. Well, um, the partitions and the brokers both were, uh, make raft groups. And in this case, um, so the cluster itself is a raft group of brokers. And then a topic is a raft group of partitions. And it, so you see that um, in this case, we have a single topic that has three different partitions. Each of those three partitions have a replica factor of three. And so we have three brokers, which means that each of those replicas for each partition are spread out evenly. And any one of these, um, any one of these zero partitions listed could at any time be the leader because in a wrapped in the RAF protocol, you have a leader um, for, for any grouping. And the same thing goes for the brokers. So um, this is the reason, the RAF protocol and the way we use it within Red Panda is the reason why we can take advantage of the resources that you give it so, uh, give Red Panda so well, and also how we make it easier to manage a Kafka scenario, sorry, uh, than than with 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 uh, Kafka itself. Um, let me know if the dogs are too loud. I, I apologize for that. Um, so cluster balancing is what is one thing that Red Panda does with the data and the partitions uh, in in a in a in a cluster to make sure that the data is spread out 
evenly across all the brokers. So um, there are multiple different ways to do that. Partition balancing is when you actually move the partitions from one broker to another based on um, the disk space that they're using up or um, how, much, how many clients are connecting to that partition, hot partitions in other words. Um, and then also leadership balancing is where the leadership, remember when I was saying that one of those zero partitions spread across all three brokers is the leader. Well, when a broker is, when a, a partition is a leader, that means that clients will be going to that partition to find out, you know, to, to get access to the data and to write to the, write to the partition and, and things like that. So that causes more load on that partition and the broker that holds that partition. So leadership balancing, just move, just saying that the new leader is on another broker can help a lot with that. And it doesn't take any data moving like what you would get with partition balancing. And then controller leader balancing, that's very similar to leadership balancing on the partition, only it's applied to the broker in uh, the wrapped group that the brokers make together to form the cluster. Um, so this is what you get out of the box if you just use the community edition. Another version or um, variant of this is continuous data balancing, which is very similar to this, but it, it Red Panda will automatically um, do this balancing for you, depending on by monitoring the network and the client, um, the clients. This is the, these uh, balancing uh, types that you get out of the box without paying for Red Panda are done when you add or remove brokers or when you restart the, the, the brokers. And you get more details uh, by following these links here. So, um, and I remember I just said that adding or remove, removing brokers is one of those things that um, will impact the, the, the balancing and the automatic balancing if you use that also. Uh, but this decommissioning consideration, um, this really applies to that and also just um, Kafka and distributed systems, like if you need to remove a node from a distributed system, there's a lot that you need to take into account before you do this. Um, so these are some of the things that you have to take into account. Um, and we have more docs on this, but this comes up a lot in distributed systems and Red Panda. How do you, um, it's really easy to add more resources to a cluster. It's not always so easy to just decommission because once those resources are part of the cluster and you start using those resources, either it's the hard drive or the CPU, um, then it, you have to take into account um, whether or not the data that lives in your cluster um, can handle more, like some of the resources being removed. Um, another thing that's key to think about in this when it comes to Red Panda, and this is a difference, a differentiation between Red Panda and Kafka is we are a thread per core architecture. So decommissioning is um, making sure to think about what, you know, if you can decommission and if so, how to do it is more important with Red Panda because those wrapped groups that I mentioned before, they actually, like every partition within that wrapped group, uh, when you look at like a topic or the, the wrapped group that partitions make across replicas, those, each of those partitions whether it's a replica or not, are pinned to a core on the broker where it lives. And so if the broker is in Kubernetes and you decide to replace a node with a cheaper one that has less cores, that will potentially make it so that the, the Red Panda will not start back up properly. And so you have to um, handle that in a specific way. And in that case, what you would do is like create a new node, a new broker, Red Panda broker, on a node that has uh, less uh, cores, and then you can decommission the old broker and move over to the new with, the, with less cores. That it, there's a doc here that um, gives a lot more details on that. The other, um, you know, interesting thing to consider, I guess, it's, it's a little, it's maybe self-explanatory, but the idea of seed servers. And this, um, it, this relates to, C, to distributed systems in general, but with Red Panda, when a broker comes up at the very first, as one of the first things that it does is it's going to 
figure out if it's part of an existing pro, uh, cluster or if it's forming a new cluster by itself. And the way that we handle that in Red Panda is by, you know, having a list of seed servers and those seed servers will be, um, if it, it, you, they all reach out to each other and decide who's the leader. And then from there, they can boot up as um, a, a cluster. And in the past, there was a different version of this, but it, for now, the easiest thing to know is that all of your brokers would have the same exact seed server list. And when you start them up, they'll um, communicate with each other and um, form the cluster. Um, so that's really the, that's basically everything. Um, and I went through it pretty fast. We didn't really take any questions during the meeting, but um, if there's any questions now, feel free to um, shoot them across. One thing I mentioned though, and unless anybody raises their hand and we can, I can continue with a little bit more ways to get information. Um, I mentioned the use case specifically focused on AI and ML and QCon, you guys may know about QCon happening right now. One of my colleagues, Wes Wagner is at QCon giving this talk, um, introduction to real-time training and scoring in AI and ML. Um, so this might be interesting. I'm not sure if, if you have access to QCon or not. If you don't, um, there's a video only pass that will give you access to this recording whenever it's up and available. Um, and this is not the only very, I'm sure, very interesting thing at QCon. I haven't looked at the, um, the schedule for this year, but um, normally I'm, I'm paying attention and finding a number of different sessions that I, I want to watch the recording of at a later time. Um, and it would be, I think it would be really interesting to get this talk in, uh, in front of everyone here, maybe in this call at some point in the future. Um, so, um, let me know what the interest is on that and I'll, I'll work on it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I had a question, um, regarding, um, so, uh, what are your. Uh, storage requirements compared to what compared to Kafka? So it's basically the same because it would be, you, you would still be storing the exact same data in both, mm -hmm. but the difference is tiered storage. So okay. if you use tiered storage, which is, um, let me explain a little bit about what tiered storage is. Um, the idea is that you have local retention for the hard drives that, that your broker has and where you're writing data to on the local uh, on brokers. And then you have remote retention and um, maybe to take a step back for everyone. Retention is just how, how long you say you want to keep that data around. And you have two different types, time and space. You can keep data around for a certain number of time, or you can keep data around until the total amount of data reaches a certain size. Um, but, and so when you add tiered storage into the mix, what that does is it backs up your cluster, the brokers in your cluster um, with S3 storage. And obviously S3 is way slower than your, um, your broker hard drives. And especially when we're talking about using NVMe drives, like what is recommended for Red Panda. But um, with, like one of the interesting things about the tiered storage implementation is that it takes into account the fact that tiered storage is slower and it, and the other, and one of the ways that it does that is Kafka and Red Panda both have a very, um, very, um, uh, what's it called? You, you, you know exactly how the data is going to be pulled off of the, the, the log every time. It's always very sequential. And so, we can intelligently pull from S3. If there's a request, the client comes in and says, I want to consume from offset zero on whatever topic. And we have local retention that's only for two weeks, but we have data in remote retention all the way up to a year. So if they're, off, if they're getting from, um, if, they're, if they're requesting, if a consumer come, comes in and requests from offset zero, that's gonna be pulling from tiered storage. So, tiered storage implementation in Red Panda, it will know that it needs to pull that offset zero, but then will immediately start pulling 
uh, the rest of the data as well. And you can put limits on um, how much the tiered storage cache is on each broker. You can put limits on how much data transfer rate you allow between S3 and the broker to make sure that you stay within network um, network transfer speeds that you, you have uh, and, and make sure that that doesn't compete more importantly with the rest of the consumers and producers in your, in your um, scenario. But um, so what that ends up meaning is that when you enable tiered storage, that first initial request by that initial consumer will be slower because it's on tiered storage. But all of the additional requests, including uh, from other consumers and also the, the additional requests from that consumer will be much faster because it will start reading from the data on the local cache on the hard drive, just the same as if it, if it were um, available under your local retention settings. So, um, and so the, the answer to your question is, there's still the same uh, limitation. You're still limited by the number, uh, by the, the size of the hard drives on your um, brokers. But if you take into account tiered storage, you could have a much larger amount of, tier, uh, of storage available overall with very minimal impact on the consumers and producers and um, much lower costs. Tier, tier storage, uh, S3 storage is way lower cost than NVMe drives, yeah. especially. Yeah. And, and do you do anything to optimize Mirror Maker? So Mirror Maker, we so Mirror Maker is one of those really important um, Kafka ecosystem tools, and we don't do anything to optimize it specifically. We're compatible with it, and we use it all the time, and especially in cases where we need to migrate. A cluster from, you know, maybe we need to migrate a cluster entirely over to another environment and we'll use Mirror Maker. Um, but at the same time, we do have an, um, so we have this idea of like Kafka Connect is one of the major ways, the main ways why people, how people are able to get um, a lot of different tools in the Kafka ecosystem plugged into their Kafka um, environment. And we offer, a Kafka Connect um, container if you're running self-hosted, and then it's built in if you're using our cloud provider. And that includes Mirror Maker 2 plugin. So that makes it, in terms of optimizing, it's not necessarily optimized, it's still Mirror Maker 2, but the benefit is that we support it. Because using getting Mirror Maker 2 um, configured correctly for your environment yeah. can be a huge hassle. And yes. That's one of the reasons why we decided to offer it as part of our our products in the cloud. Okay. Thank you. The other thing is that with tiered storage, um, with tiered storage, and then also like mainly with tiered storage, actually, you may not need Mirror Maker too, right? Because with tiered storage, there's this other capability called uh, remote read replica or read replica, and so mm -hmm. that. Um, makes it possible to have a topic where clients and producers are reading and writing on one cluster, but then another cluster entirely can have a read replica of that topic, and then consumers can connect there and pull that same data. And so that's um, that's very similar to like there are some use cases where you may have reached for Mirror Maker two, where you no longer have to do that because there's a capability built into the the product that you can use instead. Hey, Josh. Yep. So, Josh, this is Ravi from Reliant Geo. I, I was just interested to understand from you, based on the statistics you have shown, uh, the better adoption of uh, Red Panda compared to the traditional Kafka platforms. How do you see the deployment of a Red Panda-based uh, applications or virtual machines or, uh, to the VMs versus CAS container uh, as a service platforms? Do you see CAS is getting better adopted? And, and what is your experience on seeing the adoption to a telco platforms? So we've... We have customers that use both VMs and containers or Kubernetes, you know, and we have customers that use um, VMware with Kubernetes on top of the, the VMware, the, the VMs, right? Um, 
I'm not entirely sure if we've done a lot of benchmarking comparing the two different approaches. Uh, mainly, like most of the time when something like this comes up, we are focused entirely on the customer's use case. And then we, you, we do benchmarking around that use case. So in other words, the benchmarkings, the benchmarks that we do are really like, try, try to mirror the, the customer's use case as much as possible. And then we don't go the next step, which would be to um, combine that information into the benchmarks that were included in this blog, right? So maybe there are, I mean, so what I'd have to do is like dig into those benchmarks and see. I haven't found myself um, how, like, I, I know that in the past when we've done benchmarks on VMs, we've treated that as more or less very similar to our bare metal benchmarks, right? Where, um, it, it, and from the standpoint of Red Panda, there's no difference in, in terms of what we see from, from Red Panda's application. Um, but the, I, would, I would say that containers are way more popular. Like most of our uh, deployments are con containers and container -based. because of Kubernetes. In the, and another uh, question to, for you will be like, uh, how do you see the orchestration pieces? Are there some inbuilt orchestration pieces already as a part of the framework? Or you feel that based on the kind of application you're using Red Panda for, you need to have uh, those orchestrators being designed by you? How do you see that? Or you have a help chart and others like based on that you design your own? Yeah. So. There's two things. One is, like you mentioned, the Helm chart and the, and the operator um, are the two key pieces. We also have a Terraform and Ansible example project called Deployment Automation that I think I linked to right here. Well, this is to the docs we have um, related to our Deployment Automation project. Um, and this is all related to Terraform and Ansible. But so this is, um, this is what we would use to handle the orchestration. I th and when you say orchestration, I'm assuming you mean like, what if you need to add a new broker and, and, and add more resources to the cluster to handle bigger that, workloads? That's true, that's true. It's just, just for the infrastructure I'm talking about, not going to the real application, the major yeah. infra coming from here. Yeah, and so this is, so the other thing to consider though, is that with Red Panda, and this also goes for Kafka, you may not want to have that be automated. You may not want to add brokers in or, and especially not remove brokers in an automated way because um, not cost is understandable and that could be managed, but it's more of how it will impact your ordering of the data. So um, Kafka and Red Panda both um, handle ordering in the same exact way. And that's done per partition. And partitions are that, that component of the topics that live on each broker. And so if you add in uh, a new broker into your cluster, that doesn't automatically, uh, if you have say a hot partition, or if you have a topic that has three partitions and you add two more brokers to get like a five broker cluster, that you will not see um, in most cases any benefit by adding those two brokers because those three partitions could still be in, you know, still be hot partitions, no matter where they live there, right? Because what you then need to do is look at your key management. And this is getting into uh, the details of how you, um, you have to know, like, you have to look at your use case, find out how ordering is important in your use case, or if ordering is important at all, uh, for that data that's in uh, that that's coming in from your producers, and if it is, then the keys that you, that whenever you send a message, it has data, but it also has header information, and some a portion of that header information is um, uh, there's a there's a key property, and that key property is how Kafka and Red Panda both decide where that data, uh, like which partition that data is going to within a topic. And so, um, and that can be, if you don't have a key, which is the default route, then um, Red Panda will do a round robin approach where all data that comes in just chooses, it just goes sequentially around the partitions that are available in a, in a topic. Um, 
And in that case, that's really good for making use of all of the partitions. So if you did have an automated, um, but really bad for, for ordering, right? Because if you need to have ordering, you only get ordering within a partition. And if you're just doing a round robin approach, then that could totally mess up the ordering and depending on your use case, that could be really bad. But um, if you did have round robin and you did have automation around the orchestration so that new brokers come into play, then that orchestration would also have to include not just bringing in new brokers, but also increasing the number of topics in, I'm sorry, number of partitions in the topic. And then in that case, you could, um, you know, automatically start using those partitions. In, in, but that's a very unique scenario that um, it would, you, most scenarios wouldn't be, wouldn't fit that exact description. So automating orchestration in a Red Panda or Kafka environment can get really tricky. You have to take into account what the use case is, basically. The other thing to I would mention in that case is, um, and I, I just explained the adding of brokers to, at a very, very high level, but then the removing of brokers of brokers is even more complicated. And, and so it, it really is not one of those things that you would want to um, automate because um, it could it could make it so that like you, you just wouldn't be able to remove a broker if there are say there's a topic with replication factor of five and you have five brokers you wouldn't be able to remove a broker in that case because you one of those replications would have no place to live. Josh, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, sure. My first question is, um, you, you seem to stress the importance of, of the use cases. Is there any tool that you suggest to, or the best way to, to define those use cases such that they are valid so you're not having to redo them? And then my second question was, do you have any comparisons between Red Panda Enterprise and, and Red Hat AMQ? So, um, in terms of coming up with the use cases and make sure, making sure that um, it's the right, you, you configure Red Panda correctly. Um, that's really why the group that I, I work for in Red Panda exists, the customer success group, right? So, we're working with customers. I'm, I'm mainly in post sales, but we also have a pre sales arm. Um, and we work with them to, to, to listen to their scenarios and then figure out what the sizing is of the cluster and then how many partitions they need to have based on um, the ordering and the number of clients that they have. Um, so there could be a way, like I'm, I'm sure that I can find some resources that would make this easier. Um, one, of, one such resource would be sizing guidelines. So this is, uh, our documentation has a ton of information. And one good thing about this is that a lot of our documentation um, can be shared, like it's, it's applicable to, to, to Kafka as well. And the same thing, the, 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 the reverse of that is true. Also, if you find documentation that's related to sizing for Kafka, that would also, in a lot of ways, um, be applicable to Red Panda. With the caveat being that, um, you would get more performance out of a Red Panda broker in most cases than you would Kafka. Um, but this goes into a number of different things, uh, uh, things that you would consider for networking, as well as CPU and memory and storage. So this could be a good starting point um, for understanding like what you have to take into account. But then it, um, some of the questions we ask from um, new users of Red Panda when they're they have a use case, but they they may not be familiar with Red Panda or Kafka or anything. We ask them what their throughput is and what their um, how much do they expect that the clients that they have how many clients they will have. Um, also, do they expect those clients will need to get access to um, like re, do do you need to reread the data or do you only need to look at the most recent data? All of those things. Um, are important factors for figuring out what the proper sizing is for your, your cluster. 
data retention, and in other words, is what I was just describing. And then tiered storage is related to data retention too. Um, but it's also something, it's something that's hard to get perfect. It's probably impossible to get perfect the first time. And so one of the next steps that we recommend always is to do benchmarking. Once you set up the cluster in a way that you think is going to work for your use case and you have collected as much of as much information on your use case as you can, then um, you create you use open message benchmark. It's a very popular like standard for um, benchmarking um, different distributed systems, but especially Kafka and Red Panda. And um, if you run this benchmark, configure it in a way that matches your use case most closely, then you can see how your um, the cluster that you have set up and configured will handle that workload and when it will start to need um, the inevitable um, like modification to the configuration. Um, with distributed systems, there's not, um, there's going to, there's always going to be like um, a component of managing it over time. And we try to make that as easy as possible. Um, something I didn't go into, by the way, um, and if we have, I, I don't think we have enough time today, but we have a lot of information around monitoring and um, like observability. So observability, um, this is it. So we have um, different Grafana dashboards that we've created that make being able to monitor the health of your cluster relatively easy. And this is like the default one, Red Panda Ops dashboard. Um, so you can, this is an older, um, screenshot. I need to update it, but you can quickly see if your if your partition leadership is balanced, how many nodes are up, um, how much memory is allocated across all of your brokers, um, and we're constantly making updates to this. So it kind of for me, it's painful to look at this version because this is a very old version, and we've done a lot of updates to improve this. All of which are available in this GitHub repository or on Grafana itself. Let me see if I grafana.com. And then you can do a search for uh, Red Panda if you just go here, I think. No, that's not it. I forget exactly where it's at, but there's a, the Grafana dashboards website is where you would go. And then once you, um, I think this is it. No, this is the internal. Sorry. There's, if you use Grafana, you know that there's a way where you can look at all the Grafana dashboards that are available. And you can just, when you have Grafana, your Grafana instance, you can go in and just add in the ID of each of these different uh, dashboards. But this is the um, specific dashboard that um, we were just looking at and all of the capabilities that it has. So this ID that you can just get from this page or this right here is what you would just add into your instance. All right. All right. So it's, it, it can be complicated, but it, it, in every situation you would need to, um, you would need to monitor and, and manage it over time. And so, um, yeah. Just uh, one question. Uh for this like if if anyone has already using the kafka it's like kafka is something like it's been into been into the product in such a way that you have different use cases tied together with the kafka so how difficult is it to change and replace it with the red panda instance is it like you get how much is what's your experience might be working with the customer who were already using kafka before yeah. now shifting yeah. That one's easy. It's a drop-in replacement. So it's like literally you can um, you can you can use Red Panda in place of Kafka because it's it's the same Kafka API. You can spin this up and it'd be at the same endpoint. You would need to migrate your data over to Red Panda and then make sure the endpoint matches the previous endpoints for the Kafka cluster, and then your clients would work as expected. So all the Kafka libraries like 
uh, from different languages would work seamlessly? R right, because like all of the clients in the Kafka ecosystem will still continue to work because they all speak the Kafka protocol. So it, it takes it out of the equation, um, whether you're using a Java client or a Go client, all of them would, would continue to work. In fact, one of the most popular Go clients, Friends Go, um, the developer behind that, the, the, the one maintainer for that uh, project works for Red Panda too, and is responsible for creating the, um, the CLI for Red Panda RPK. Okay. Yeah, that's good to know. Thanks. And what is like uh, uh, one more follow up question? If you have still a few minutes, uh, is it you mentioned about the raft uh, protocol, the consensus for the consensus? And I have seen like Zookeeper is being used for many distributed system, which uses I think uh, different protocols. So what's the what are the kind of what do you think where the raft gets is is more powerful in which sense than the what zookeeper uses yeah so the benefit there is that we don't need zookeeper at all right the metadata that zookeeper is used in a kafka um, environment for managing the metadata and in many cases like well it, it all in all cases you have a kafka deployment along with that that's its own cluster with its own nodes in its own distributed system, along with another zookeeper instance, uh, a cluster that has its own nodes and, and um, replication. And so zookeeper is used in that situation for managing the metadata for the cluster. Um, in Red Panda, you don't have zookeeper. It's all included in Red Panda, and that's because of our use of the RAF protocol. So um, that's one of the biggest simple uh, ways Red Panda is simpler than um, Kafka at at managing and, and maintaining it over time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks.